grants that uh, we have in the program is not just for uh, a full semester or a complete academic year, but there are also some short-term grants that you can go away for two or three weeks covering that also. And then we're gonna hear from uh, some special speakers and some of your colleagues here who are gonna talk about their field experience too. So we have um, about an hour and a half or so uh, left, so let me get started. Um, so uh, we've got the introduction out of the way, which is super, thank you for, for that. And, uh, that you, oh, you're, yes, yes, yes. Um, great, so let's start then with the view from the top. Um, it's kind of a treat to have Jamie on the trip. Um, he's my go-to person for any public affairs related questions that I have. Um, state, of course, pays for is a sponsor for the program. Uh, we at the Institute of International Education and my division administrators of the program that um, is very much a collaboration and um, they have priorities in the administration for the standalone program. So, Jamie, if you might talk about that a little bit. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I like to call this the sort of 30,000 foot view from Washington. I think it's important for you all to sort of understand the context of uh, Fulbright as a public diplomacy effort of the U.S. government. I told the group uh, I spoke to this morning that we really are living in the golden age of Fulbright. Uh, we've never had more money, we've never had more support, we've never had more grants to offer. Uh, we're at about $300 million total in terms of uh, U.S. congressional funding. Um, I should say $250 million of U.S. congressional funding and $50 million or so from foreign governments, uh, university and kind donations, and uh, other private donations. Uh, the program. But the majority of the money comes from uh, U.S. taxpayer dollars, something that a lot of people don't realize about Fulbright. I think you know, it was endowed by some great man named Fulbright long ago without really knowing the history of the program. And of course, uh, for those that do uh, know the history of the program, Senator Fulbright, uh, the senator from Arkansas, had this great idea. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He understood the uh, importance of doing the international exchange personally. And he decided uh, on the end of the Second World War to use some of the surplus war materials fund the first grants. It's a really, really a unique idea and uh, one that's had uh, a, a lasting impact on over 300,000 people now that have gone through the program. We've been going strong for about 60 years, but uh, we've never been stronger, as I just mentioned. And uh, we've seen the program effectively double, almost triple in size in the last 10 years. For the group today, uh, I thought I would focus on a couple of key uh, points for the scholar program. Of course, uh, Fulbright encompasses many, many different programs, uh, including the student program that Lee works on. We have a classroom teacher exchange program, which is a one-to-one -one exchange for uh, elementary and secondary school teachers to exchange classrooms for a short period of time. And then we also have uh, the Fulbright Hayes program, which uh, many of you may be familiar with. Anybody do a Fulbright Hayes program? <laughs> run by the Department of Education, but also under the Fulbright umbrella. And then there's a program called the Humphrey Program, which is a small part of uh, Fulbright as well, which brings mid-career professionals from foreign countries to the United States. So a very, very big program, about 8,000 uh, total grants. Um, really uh, a unique opportunity for just about everybody. We operate in 155 different countries around the world. We have 50 binational commissions uh, that operate with staff from both the United States and from foreign countries. We also have uh, over 100 plus U.S. embassies that are working on the program. So lots of moving parts uh, in, in, in full time. So in terms of the scholar program, I think I would just say that after uh, a few years of decline in terms of the total number of applications, we've turned a corner. Thanks uh, in large part uh, to Ed and his staff at CIES, who've done a fantastic job of going out on the road and recruiting uh, for the program. Uh, when Ed started, numbers were down, but we are back up again uh, in, in a very large way. Ed and uh, primarily his staff uh, of road warriors have been to over 200 campuses, I think he was telling me this morning. So uh, really, really on the road a lot and, and people about the road, which is important. We can't just do it through websites, we have to do it through in-person business. I think the main message that I want to impart today is that really there's never been a better time to apply for a Fulbright grant more opportunities for you all uh, to teach, to do research, to do a combination of both, to do a Fulbright Specialist Grant, which are the short-term two to six-week grants, which some of you are familiar with. Um, there are other opportunities.
opportunities for a campus like UF to host foreign uh, scholars, to bring foreign scholars to other campuses for short periods of time to uh, the University of Florida. So lots and lots of opportunities uh, for everybody in the room to think about ways that Fulbright can help you with your careers. As we've expanded the program, we really have made a focus on diversity. And by diversity, I mean not just racial and ethnic diversity, but institutional diversity, geographic diversity, and socioeconomic diversity. So a trip like this is really great for us. We're going all across the state of Florida. We're uh, getting you know, big research institutions, uh, minority serving institutions. We'll be in Florida a &M tomorrow, uh, getting an HBCU. We're at Valencia Community College uh, on Monday, talking to some of the community college uh, administrators about ways that they can be involved with Fulbright. So it's really, really important for us to make sure that Fulbright represents America because it is this taxpayer-funded program. It really does have to represent all of the American academic community. <clears throat> In terms of priorities for this administration, and some of you may be curious uh, to see how the Obama administration is putting its stamp on, on Fulbright. Now, I should say that Fulbright is uh, a political program. It's supposed to be nonpartisan. It's set up uh, uh, in a way that the State Department, which does sponsor the program, doesn't have its hands in the program, really, the administration, the management. The day-to-day -day operations are really handled by uh, IIE, by CIES, and some of our other cooperating agencies. And I think that's a good thing. But each administration that does come in likes to put its mark on certain programs and certain priority areas. And I thought I would just highlight a couple of those uh, for you. Food security, climate change, and the environment international women's issues, public health and pandemics, and science and technology in the developing world are, I think, some of the priorities you all should be aware of in terms of applying for grants. Of course, uh, a lot of those priority areas cover a lot of different disciplines, so that's a good thing, right? Um, in terms of key world areas, I would suggest uh, countries like India. We two years ago signed a bilateral agreement with the Indian government that doubled the size of the Fulbright program uh, effectively in India. The awards now will be known as uh, Fulbright Nehru Awards, and now is a really fantastic time to think about applying for a grant in India. Lots of different opportunities there, uh, both the student program side and the scholar program side. So uh, I think we'll continue to see growth uh, in that program. Um, because it did double very quickly, we were sort of uh, in a rush to fill a lot of those scholarship opportunities. So now it's even a better time, I think, to apply because not too many people know about this doubling in the size of the program. Not for long. Not for long, exactly. <laughs> because every presentation we go to, we, we tell people uh, we're going to get more and more applications. So now is a, a golden opportunity to do that. How many do you have? How many grants? I mean, to India. To India? Yeah. But we have by the way, about 40. So the number before, two years ago, was 20 or so, and now we're up to 40. And that's it for 40 is for this coming academic year, 2011-2012. So if you were to apply this year by August, the uh, beginning of August, you'd be going out sometime. Uh, and I'm going to call the research ones with that good research and lecture. Awesome. Can I ask another question? Yes. I am originally from India. Mm -hmm. I'm a user designer. Yes. Is that an advantage for me to apply to? We have many uh, what we call heritage grantees, uh, folks who have come to the United States, perhaps naturalized, and then go back to uh, their country of origin. Um, I would say it's not a disadvantage. I would say that um, the Fulbright Scholarship Board, the presidentially appointed board that oversees all the program and makes the final decisions about grants, is looking at this issue in, in certain areas of the world where we have uh, what they consider to be too many heritage grantees applying to go back. Uh, but it hasn't really, I don't think, been a huge problem for, for India, as far as I know. So I would encourage you to consider applying. And in many cases, uh, a person such as yourself would be able to make connections uh, in a better way than maybe some of you have never been there before. Uh, a couple of other countries that I would just uh, note before I turn it over to Ed, and it is the main event. I don't want to take up too much of this time, but I would say Turkey, Russia, China, and Indonesia. A lot of those are uh, sort of self-evident uh, for strategic purposes. Indonesia, obviously, uh, is important to the president personally, having spent some time there as a child. They've been going there in June. Uh, and I would expect that perhaps he would make some uh, sort of 
announcement about uh, an increase in exchange programs for Indonesia. Whether that will happen under Fulbright, I don't know, but now is a great time to think about uh, Indonesia. And I already know that we are working on some partnerships with uh, universities there to help train up their faculty. So a great opportunity if anybody's thinking about that part of the world. Sub-Saharan Africa, anybody interested in going to Sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, we don't get a lot of applications there. Uh, we're always looking for brave souls to, to venture there. And I think that really the grantees that have the most rewarding experience often come from that part of the world. Um, you can make a great impact in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Not to say that you can't do that in other parts of the world, uh, but particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, I think uh, the advantages of being a full there are, are very good. Central Asia is another area that I think uh, focusing on more. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Western Hemisphere, um, particularly Central America and the Caribbean. I know down here in Florida you all are very in tune with uh, that particular region. Up in D.C. and in other parts of the U.S. we sometimes tend to forget about our own backyard. So we're looking to increase the number of applications to particular parts of the world. Yes, sir? Uh, notably missing uh, East and Central Europe. That's not high priority. It, it is. I, I should note that just because I'm mentioning these doesn't mean that you know, we're taking away from other parts of the program. Fulbright's not a zero sum game just because we're moving uh, parts around and moving money around. We're going to stop focusing on those regions of the world. Uh, and in fact, uh, we talked a little bit this morning about Central and Eastern Europe uh, and the changes in the program there. I think uh, Ed can talk a little bit about the, the new grants in that region of the world. We talked this morning about some of the student grants, English teaching. It's a huge priority for this administration, so we're going to send a lot more English teachers to Central and Central Asia. Uh, how are you defining Central Asia? Uh, the State Department breaks things down into six geographic regions. Uh, the Central Asia uh, Bureau covers uh, essentially Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Turkmenistan, Bangladesh. Oh, no. And probably a few others that I missed. Ukraine and Russia and Azerbaijan, those are all considered to be part of the European Affairs Branch. But as you all know, these sort of arbitrary definitions. But for our purposes, Central Asia sort of looks like that. I said Tokyo, and I assume that South America. Absolutely, yes. Uh, so Central America, the Caribbean, I mentioned is, uh, its priorities, but of course South America is, of course, in our backyard as well. And anybody who has a, a background in Latin America, speaks Spanish, please, please apply for grants. Are, are there particular countries, since you're naming countries, within the Americas, within Latin America, Caribbean, that you mentioned? What do you say? Brazil is huge, Mexico is huge, Argentina is one of our oldest programs. Um, Let me ask a question. What you're talking about? Emphasis, are you saying that these are less competitive programs than you want for academics? Because I know that some of the European countries are less competitive. Right. Uh, for example, yes, Sub Saharan Africa, Central Asia, Western Hemisphere, other than sort of the ones that we typically hear about Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, it's harder to attract that. Western Europe is very, very, very competitive. And I don't want to discourage anybody from flying to Western Europe if that's where your research is, if that's where you want to teach, if that's really where your project has to be done. I do consider doing that. I just want to lay out there some of the pros and cons of possibly applying. Uh, as soon as you get returned like that. Which African countries? Um, Nigeria. Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Egypt, Egypt. 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 is part of the Middle Eastern region of North Africa. But, um, we're going to look at specific examples. Ed has got his little pen drive back there. I encourage all of you to pick up that as a whole catalog of awards on every grant that's available to every country with detailed descriptions. So, Vinci, you mentioned Egypt. Is that considered Africa? That is broken into the uh, Middle East and North Africa region, okay. um, or Near Eastern Affairs, as we call it. It uh, goes by different names, but yes, that's considered one part of the Middle East region. Also important, I don't want to, you know. Sometimes I don't like to go down this road because everybody says, well, what about the country I want to apply to, the country I'm interested in? Uh, I just think it's sometimes a good idea to let people know what the administration is prioritizing. Uh, can you give a, an a approximate successful rate? Like a 
50% of the application, or is it like a 15% of the application? It depends uh, by country. Yeah. I can talk a little bit about uh, application numbers versus how many people succeed. Uh, overall, we had, uh, yeah, you want to do that? Sure. Um, the figure is misleading without context. So let me say that first, because um, if, for example, you want to apply for, let's say, art history war in Italy, <laughs> if you are um, in physics and want to go to Kazakhstan, chances are, and that's a difficult thing for me to prove for, to see, the, see that, uh, that that's uh, maybe you know, on average for that award, maybe three, let's say, applicants. So in aggregate terms, you're looking at about um, 2,500 or so applicants in the program, 600 grants in the catalog. See how that's leading because by country, it would be extremely competitive than you know, most of your Back to you. I think, uh, another thing I would just say that I wanted to dispel a myth, I guess. Um, the myth that Fulbright is unattainable for anybody who doesn't have a 10 page CG or gigantic publication record or 4.0 GPA on the student side. Uh, that really is a myth. There's